Hi, my name is Daniel Kitts. I'm the online editor of the Agenda with Steve Pagan. And as part of Autism Awareness Day, we wanted to talk about uh, various conditions that uh, related to autism that uh, children can have and how they can be diagnosed more quickly and effectively. And to that end, I'm joined by Natasha D'Souza. She's the developer of Zeely Adventures, which is an application for children with autism spectrum disorder, Asperger's syndrome, and or ADHD. Uh, Natasha, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me on the show. Now, uh, you're inspired, you were inspired to um, create this application in part because uh, you have some personal experience with uh, a child who uh, has a, a condition. Uh, tell me, um, when did you uh, first um, feel that uh, one of your children might have an issue that needed to be dealt with? I would probably say very early on uh, because my child uh, wasn't a very good sleeper and if you look at the milestones and, and all of those kinds of things, there was a lot of things done uh, on the sleep side of things and, and so that was an issue because babies, you know, as they develop are supposed to sleep. Um, in terms of milestones, uh, they were exceeded walk before a year, uh, all those kinds of things. Uh, I was very involved in the early childhood development programs, took them to play groups and things like that. But there was always something off. And so I knew by the age of one that there was something, but I didn't know how to articulate it. And I would go to my pediatrician and everything was great. You know, the weight was great, the milestones were being met, you know, we did the shots, we did everything. But I would say in my case, I knew fairly early on. Hmm. When, uh, how old was the child and how did you finally found out, find out that your, your strong feeling that something was off was in fact the case? Very late, actually. So uh, we started them off in preschool at the age of three. So we would get good feedback. And so they were really good at giving us feedback in terms of how the day went and, and things like that. And, uh, you know, we'd always get feedback, you know, it takes too long to put the snowsuit on, you know, needs a lot of help. At the time, you know, this is something we observed at home, didn't think much of it. Um, again, lots of feedback in JK and SK, uh, fabulous teachers, uh, but there were things going on in terms of uh, just certain things in the classroom, you know, maybe isolating the child from the rest of the group, uh, when they're younger, circle time is so important and is a huge part of uh, the learning and the play that happens, and, and my child wasn't able to participate uh, in circle time. So again, got a lot of feedback there. It wasn't really until the end of grade one where uh, we were fortunate to have a teacher that tried all kinds of things and gave us, you know, feedback. She would call us up and say, I'm, I'm going to try this new strategy and kudos to her. We had documented all kinds of stuff. So at this point, I knew it was time to get testing. Uh, now schools are limited in their testing and they get Perhaps they have budget. with really high needs, maybe they're really violent or aggressive or things like that. Uh, my child didn't fall into that category. Uh, however, if you have an extended health care plan, it's great. So uh, we leveraged that and we uh, took our child to get testing privately. The thing that we didn't know is that even though you go with private testing, it could be anywhere from six months to a year before you can get an appointment. So uh, my advice to parents is if you notice things are just not working out, they're not going to get better, your child needs a little something extra, make that appointment. It does take a long time to get there and, and you really need to work with your teacher because what happens there is the teacher fills out the forms, each of the parents fills out their observations and, and then you meet with the psychologist that does the testing and, and based on the discussion there, they will decide on the type of testing to do. Mm. So it does take a long time. Um, what is interesting about your application is that, you know, often when we see uh, efforts, programs, etc., to help uh, children with certain conditions, they're often very focused on a specific condition, on autism, for example, or ADHD, or what have you. And, and your application is intended to uh, help a number of, of different 
conditions that we often, at least in the popular consciousness, don't often associate with each other. Mm -hmm. um, why did you decide to do that? Why is it important in your view to, or, or what is it about all these conditions that have a common thread that you think needs to be, uh, needs to be dealt with? So it was it was my personal journey of you know as a parent uh, just being stressed out, frustrated, not knowing where to go next, not even to be honest having the vocabulary to even know what to look for because doctors will um, look at the development of your child in terms of motor skills, weight, have they taken their shots? Um, so if your child is we're not really going to get any help there. Their school really happens later on and it's again about reading, writing and uh, math. So the focus there is helping the kids build those skills. So when you have a child with special needs, this kind of falls in that in-between category and um, what I'd like parents to know is there's things as speech and language pathologists, occupational therapists, child psychologists, uh, applied behavior analysts. Um, there's all kinds of people out there that can help your child. So it was this journey of trying to find a solution, trying to find out who to take my child uh, for help. And also, I was in grad school at the time, so I had access to the academic journals. And that's when it really opened the door for me, is that um, there's all kinds of amazing research done. And that's when I found the correlation between um, ADHD, autism spectrum disorder, uh, Down syndrome, fetal alcohol spectrum, traumatic brain injury, that the common theme here is that children uh, cannot interpret facial expressions. However, facial expressions is the fundamental way in which we actually communicate. So these children don't pick up on these nonverbal cues, but research says you can actually teach them these skills. Certain aspects of empathy can be taught, and once mastered, they have this for life. So that was, you know, that was incredibly um, positive for me, and, and I was very excited. Then I started to look at um, programs out there. So you can put your child in social skills camps as, um, uh, you know, as young as three to five years old. Uh, you can put them in, you can put them in a play group, but if there's no one actually teaching them these nonverbal cues, it's not very effective because they're not going to pick up on it like a typical child would. Um, and then research said something beautiful. It said if their social skills were offered at school, a success rate is higher. And that's where we fail because schools uh, are not mandated nor have the resources to teach children social skills. And, you know, if you have a class of 20, 30 children and you have one or two kids that have a problem, you know, how does the teacher address that? And I also started to look at um, tools, and I realized we were severely lacking effective tools. So the whole point behind discovering emotions with Zeely is that this is um, uh, accessible via an iPad, and uh, a lot of early childhood education now is happening via tablets. And so it was to leverage the existing technology that is there already in the classroom. I see. It is very interesting the observation you make that both are sort of our, our medical system, our school system uh, are geared towards evaluating certain things. In the case of the medical system, it's physical health uh, more so than emotional health. And in uh, the school system, it's more about uh, knowledge and competencies rather than sort of the, the social interaction, which is so important uh, to us. Uh, we, we kind of assume that kids are going to learn it on their own. Um, you're obviously trying to help that with Zeely Adventures. Is there any specifics? Are there any specific steps that you would like to see schools, for example, adopt to uh, become better at at uh, teaching these skills and identifying um, social deficits in some in some students? Yes. Yeah, so um, you know, if your child has a learning disability or has uh, you know whether it's autism spectrum disorder or some other conditions, you know, and in a lot of cases it's not just one condition. They could have multiple. Uh, they call it multiple diagnosis. Um, the early signs are there. Uh, when they're young, it usually displays itself as behavior um, and anxiety. So if there's a child 
uh, having meltdowns, if there's a child uh, hitting and biting and things like that, those are early indicators of things to come down the road. So although they may be too young to actually go through some of the psychoeducational testing, um, that's the time to kind of intervene and teach the child these social skills. You know, teach them uh, to recognize emotions uh, when they're younger age. We know for a fact that children on the spectrum have challenges interpreting angry expressions. And the way that manifests itself in the school system is you'll get feedback from teachers or even parents' experience that your child is smirking at them when they're angry. That's a clear indication that child doesn't understand what's going on. They're not being bad. It's also a known fact that uh, children with Down syndrome have challenges interpreting surprised and fear. So then again, that is something that you can break down and teach the child. So um, I brought those concepts into uh, Zeely Adventures. To, uh, we pick seven basic emotions that transcend gender and ethnicity. Uh, to, uh, we train them on, you know, let's look at the mouth, you know, what's going on around the mouth. Let's look at the eyes. Let's look at what's going on around the eyebrows. Children with ASD look at the mouth first. That's their comfort zone. Yet a lot of emotions are conveyed through the eyes. So this first module is to really break that down. Um, we've worked with uh, child psychologists and speech and language pathologists to simplify the language and uh, made it interactive and fun in gaming so that the child is motivated to go through. Uh, in the settings menu, we actually provide reporting. So it's real-time reporting on how the child is progressing. So zeliadventures.com is where people can find out a little bit more about uh, your app. You've given, uh, I think, parents a lot of... Um, good ideas as to what they can do if they find themselves in a similar situation to what you faced when, when your child was younger. Um, to wrap up, is there anything else, any other advice or anything else you think someone who is in the situation you faced, um, is there anything else they should do or any other resources they should go to uh, to figure out what may or may not be uh, wrong with their child? Um, I would say uh, start to look at, uh, so if you start to look for labels like ADHD, uh, autism, um, you know, Down syndrome is generally uh, diagnosed fairly early, um, things like that, and try to find uh, associations or organizations in your area. So uh, Ottawa has a whole bunch of resources, Toronto has a whole bunch of resources. They're all uh, typically nonprofit organizations or, uh, you know, speech and language pathologists, uh, you know, start to, you know, they, they, they all know each other and they, they cross refer occupational therapists. That, again, wasn't something that was part of my vocabulary. Um, and, and start to uh, look at those resources um, and uh, start that conversation. Just start the conversation with them and, and it will go from there. Fair enough. Well, Natasha D'Souza of ZeliAdventures.com, uh, I really appreciate you uh, sharing your insight with us today. Thank you very much.